Hello, welcome to Free Will, Science, and Religion. I'm Chandler Klebs, and I'm here with George Ortega, and we're going to continue the the topic of what is everything up to, since it's since not up to us what we do, because we don't have a free will. Um, so we we've kind of we've kind of talked about this in previous episodes, but in case this is like the first episode that anybody listens to, maybe we should just go through the basics of explaining why we don't have free will, and then maybe um, expand on that and think, well, it's not up to us. So then, what is it up to? All right, that sounds good. Uh, just you know, very briefly, um, if we can. If we can agree that everything has a cause, then, then we apply that reasoning to anything we human beings do. So like we make a decision, there's a cause to that decision. Now the thing to remember is that the cause will always come before what it causes. So all right, we make a decision, there's a cause to that decision. And again, we're, our premise is that everything has a cause. So there's going to be a cause to that cause that preceded it and a cause to that cause, and a cause to that cause. And so what you end up with is a chain of cause and effect. You know, the effects are what causes create or cause. And then it stretches back in time. And this, this chain just basically stretches back to before we were born, before the planet was created. That's why free will is completely impossible. So why don't you explain now, like, some people say, well, well, perhaps not everything has a cause. What's our answer to that? Right. Well, if, if anything doesn't have a cause, well, then obviously you're not the cause. So you can't be the free willer or chooser of that event happening. So in a, that whole point is it's still not up to you. <laughs> right. And, and here, the, the key thing here is like it is no more complicated than that. People, you know, who who need to believe that they have a free will, that we have a free will, will, at will attempt to make it more complicated, to, to suggest that it's more complicated. But no, when you look at the basic logic, things are either caused or uncaused, and both prospects equally, completely make free will impossible. Yeah. You know, it is a very simple thing to explain and to refute. I mean, and I think your two-step refutation works quite nicely for that, you know. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's it's pretty much simple. Sometimes people need longer books written, and there's plenty of books out there, you know, that we, we read a lot of them, you know, going into detail of of all the reasons, including the, uh, the unconscious and all that. But since... We like once somebody does understand, and hopefully they understand that. Because if they don't understand that, then they're not going to have a clue what the rest of the stuff was we're talking about. <laughs> but um, then it leads to the idea: well, then it's not up to us because everything we do happens from either causal or random events, depending on whether you believe in a causality. So it can't be up to us, and it can't be up to our parents or our grandparents, and it just goes back further in time until the only way I look at it is that everything is up to the infinite cause of regression. Right. Now here's where our question for this episode begins. Um, atheists tend to be far more rational, far more logical than theists. They, they explore things from a rational perspective. They need evidence, logical evidence. But, you know, I think to certain ages, I, uh, atheists, I think their, their aversion to conventional religion, to conventional ideas of God, really um, perhaps don't, you know, come in the, they come in the way of their understanding this, this um, the nature of reality. In other words, like, um, a lot of atheists will, will understand that we don't have a free will so that things aren't up to us. And, but then, then, um, then when, when it comes to like exploring, well, fine, if things are not up to us, to who, to whom or what are they up to? Um, they just say they're up to the universe 
but it's an amorphous kind of answer. It, 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 it's vague and unclear because, like, basically, they're not ascribing or attributing any consciousness, any intelligence to the universe, meaning, like, that seemingly they are, they believe that all this structure, the laws of nature, all the, these processes, this com complexity, somehow evolved randomly. randomly. And, um, and to my mind, that just, you know, it seems like, you know, again, like, we might need to go into the, this, this um, topic of randomness, what it is, but I, I simply can't see, you know, the, this, for example, these, these, um, this internet connection we're talking over, you know, evolving or coming about because of some random process. Yeah, I think we do need to go into the randomness um, in case people are still not clear on that. Because the way that they make it sound, you know, the atheist books that I've read, the stuff I've read about evolution, the kinds of stuff that they have out there is basically, you know, stuff about random mutations and things happening for no reason and, and, and the universe popping out of nothing. And the, the way that they say it, it does sound crazy. Um, and I never actually went for, for that because I, I always think that there's a cause for everything, but I do not believe that you can explain the way the universe is and the way life is without always believing that there is conscious at the consciousness at the smallest level. Um, and the reason I say this is, you know, because, for example, um, I think it might have been it might have been Mitch um, who said something about the um, the law of entropy in an email. Something about how you know if a house is left by itself, it'll just get all all dusty and disorganized and all that stuff. And so a lot of and this is what's interesting. A lot of theists, you know, usually they end up monotheists or creationists or Christians. Well, they say, well, that order doesn't come from disorder. You know, that things would just decay and become more scattered and randomized um, unless there was unless there was something to keep maintain it. And my answer for that is a simple explanation. Now, you know, people will will say, well, how do you, do you have evidence of this channel? Can you prove it? And I'm like, well, I don't know how to respond to that, but here's how I handle the situation. I handle it, think, wait a minute. We can observe that humans are conscious. We see this in other mammals. We see this in fish and, and lizards and insects, especially even the tiniest of insects like the ant. And I think, well, I, I mean, I don't look at an anthill, you know, as being a, a just a random thing that happened. I view the ants ha as intentionally forming a community and doing this. And they intentionally store their food to get them through the winter. And I look at all these life forms doing what they do intentionally. And I'm not saying they're freely willing it, but I'm just saying that they are doing their actions for a purpose, for for a reason, um, and the and of course the intent usually has something to do with surviving and reproducing. But if somebody like if George, here's what's cool is if somebody takes my premise as true, which I'm not I'm not sur sure yet how effectively I can argue for this premise, but if my premise is true that basically at least all life is conscious. I'm not sure about inorganic matter, but organic matter, you know, that there's some kind of small consciousness and even the smallest of things, then all of a sudden you, if you, that premise is taken true, well then the randomness, this seemingly for no reason and everything unconscious and stupid and undirected evolution, well then all that has to be wrong in some way. If my premise about this consciousness in all, thi all living things is true. Right, and, and let's look at this order versus disorder um, from a more fundamental perspective because like it seems, because like, Order seems to connote purpose, you know, some kind of intent. Disorder, you know, seems to connote randomness or things just happening without any any reason. But 
But here's the thing. Um, if we go back to the first event in the universe of which we have sufficient knowledge, that's the Big Bang, we have to, it's no longer a question of versus, of whether there is order versus disorder. You know, from the perspective of the Big Bang and then following the evolution of the universe to today, to, to today we have to conclude that disorder is as much an illusion as is free will. In other words, there is no disorder. And the reason I say that, because basically you have whatever matter was like at the, um, at the moment of the Big Bang. Okay, the, now, <clears throat> over the next milliseconds, thousands of milliseconds, seconds and all, that, that universe expanded according to the laws of nature that, that were inherent in the universe at the Big Bang and, and, and perhaps presumably before the Big Bang. So, so basically, you have every particle that's being created and that's moving you know, to a different place, every, every gas that's being formed, being, you know, being formed according to um, these laws. These laws are compelling their action. Okay, so like you can't con conclude that that's a disordered process. In other words, it's, it's completely governed. When, when we understand, I think what I'm trying to say is when, when we understand that the laws of nature govern everything, then we have absolutely no evidence or no reason to suggest that anything in the universe is quote unquote disordered. You know, in other words, like order, order is ubiquitous throughout throughout the universe yes and what's interesting is some one of the definitions of randomness that i often see is basically things not being in arranged in order that it just seemingly no it's disorder disorganized you know that's one of the meanings of randomness that people use and so i don't look at i don't look at the universe and think I don't think disordered randomness. I don't think a causal happening for no reason randomness. I do not believe that there's any sense of randomness which applies to the universe we're in. Yeah, and, and let's apply this like we, you, were, you mentioned evolution before. Some people suggest that quote-unquote random mutation is a random process in the strong sense of having no order. But again, we have to acknowledge that those genes, those that DNA, that RNA, the the uh, the components of of evolution follow are guided by are governed by the laws of nature. There is no room for like you can't have the laws of nature governing everything and and side by side, you know, things happen quote unquote randomly in the strong sense of not being caused or not being ordered. In other words, like, you know, the laws of nature, they compel order. They are order. Yeah. And it's a very interesting thing because the idea of the DNA, um, you know, some people have explained it in terms of instructions, like, like it's like a computer program or something. And if that's the case, well, then that implies some type of CPU or interpreter that is reading the instructions, if they, if they take it as far as that goes, um, which, which brings in the subject of intelligence. It brings up the idea that, um, that there is an order of which an organism, some living organism is to be built so that it starts out as a very small thing and, and, and ends up, you know, whatever animal or plant it's going to be. Um, cause that's, because that's what's interesting, because I, I would think that if things were as random as the people try to make it sound sometimes, then that you would have no explanation for why you get, you know, apple trees from apple seeds, you know? You know what I'm saying? That... What it, they, they, these tiny seeds, you know, grow into these huge plants, you know? Exactly. If the, if the most fundamental level 
of nature was random, then you would see no order at all in the universe. You know, you would, and especially you wouldn't see the, the, the pervasive order that you see all around you, just in, in any room, you know, or, or you just go outside, the order of a tree, the order of, of plants and all. You wouldn't see any of that if, if the fundamental nature of the universe were random. And, and you can't, you know, when you, when you think about it, there's no, there's no logical way to conceive of randomness and order coexisting. In other words, some people say that parts of nature are random, parts are causal or deterministic. That's impossible because like to, to posit that, then you'd have to like explain how the two, you know, different systems operating under different laws, actually one operating on under no law at all, could exist. And then you'd also have to explain how this random component of the universe um, could be random, you know, given the laws of nature, given the, 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 the thermo, the, the electromagnetic force, the weak and strong nuclear force and gravity, you know, because these, these forces impose order, you know, that they, they, they make randomness impossible. Yeah, and another thing that's important to point out is as soon as you try to introduce randomness or a causality into the mix, well, then you're faced with a, a little bit of a dilemma because aside from the fact that that also, you know, completely refutes free will even more than determinism would if it was possible, it also means that there's no reason why the deterministic events happen if they stemmed from things happening for no reason. If that makes any sense. Exactly. You can't have you can't have a deterministic process evolve or emerge from a random process. You know, the question you'd have to answer is, oh yeah, well, at, at one point does this unordered, you know, just movement of things order itself to become something, something that that, that is visibly ordered, that has structure, that has purpose, that has all these kinds of attributes that we attribute to life, to our human beings. You know, yeah, it, it's completely, you know, incoherent, the, the, this concept of randomness. All right, so, let's, so getting back to, you know, a lot of atheists, they have a very understandable rejection of God, the way God has been presented in theology, you know, um, for example, an all good God, you know, if, if we define goodness as what we what creates happiness, then I think we have to define evil as what creates unhappiness. <laughs> and, and if we define God as omnipotent, then, you know, either God is all powerful, <laughs> and both and, um, and both good and bad, or God is not all-powerful all and is only good. Now, I, I think it makes more sense to conclude that God is all-powerful and good and bad. You know, because like, again, who, if, if, God, if, if God is all-powerful, to what would we attribute evil if it were not God? And so like, so basically the reason I'm mentioning this, because like to a lot of atheists, they they will they will give the non answer that well things just happen you know things that are <laughs> evolution you know the, the the evolution of not just human beings of, of life but of the the universe you know the, the formation of, of planets of, of galaxies of stars just happened without any governance without any governance by the laws of nature or they'll say the laws of nature are just laws of nature no. Anytime you have any kind of governance, you are suggesting very strongly that this governance is an intelligence. And it's an intelligence far stronger and far more pervasive than that that, um, that we human beings experience. Yeah, and here's what's particularly interesting about it. We're all faced with the same thing, that of an infinite regress. No, and it doesn't matter how much um, determinism or indeterminism you throw into the mix. It doesn't matter whether you're atheist or theist. At some point, you got to admit something always was here. Something always existed. You know, it's not, it's, for example, you know, it, people, people will say, 
you know, people who believe in a creator God, you know, the traditional monotheistic God, for example, they'll say, um, you know, all life comes from God, all consciousness and intelligence comes from God. Well, then, you, so then I ask them, well, where did God get life? And they're like, oh, God didn't need to get life. He just had it, <laughs> you know, which it, which just brings the, the idea of they, they claim God always existed and God always had life. God was always intelligent. Therefore, intelligence, consciousness, life always existed. So my, my belief as an atheist and their claims as theists are actually one in the same when you get down to it as far as the whole life, which I think is a combination of consciousness and intelligence. Exactly. I mean, it's like this, this idea of reality, whether you call it the universe or God, um, having existed eternally and you know, always existing eternally, never ending, never having had a beginning, um, in a certain sense, perhaps it transcends logic. I mean, like, I mean, I, it, it's much more, it's much more believable, understandable to me to suppose that everything always existed than to than to posit that there was a beginning to everything because as, again as soon as we posit that then we're asking well what created the beginning so so in a certain sense like it does you know but but then we get to this like you know imagine like i don't know how many zeros are are what are nine zeros in a, in a trillion well imagine a trillion zeros you know you know, and spanning, um, you know, re designating years, you know, going back. Because right, right now we deal with a universe that's uh, 13.8 billion years. Imagine, you know, something so much larger, a number so much larger than a, a trillion. Then again, like a, a trillion is nine zeros. This would be like a one followed by, you know, a trillion zeros. I mean, so like, I mean, that, it just blows my mind to think about it, but yeah, but it, <laughs> and because it's, it's really endless. There's, they're like, and the idea of limits no longer makes sense when you're talking about the entirety of the universe. It's, it's like we, we are stuck. I think because of the fact that we're stuck on this planet, we have limits of resources of food and water and air. We have these limits and uh, limits of space. But if you talk about the whole universe, you're talking about a pretty much infinite um, vastness of, of space. You know, it's not like there would be a limit because what would there be to limit it? And that's, again, there's like, there's parts of like um, reality that I mean, yeah, they, they, the scientists tell us that the universe at one point was a singularity smaller than an atom. You know, the, the, the entirety of this universe is so vast, was compressed to that size, then it expanded to our uh, the present size of the universe. But then, of course, one question is, you know, what did the, did it expand into? And I, you know, I've heard <laughs> certain answers that the that uh, that use the balloon analogy, but I'm sorry, they they don't seem convincing to me. And another thing, we're getting a bit off topic, but this is kind of interesting. You know, on the one hand, they say that the universe at one point, you know, started from let's say a point that's smaller than an atom. Now that's that's a point. You know, it's, it definitely has a point, and then expanded from that point. So like. On the one hand, they say that, and on the one hand, they say that there is no center to the universe. But to my mind, if the universe began at the point of the Big Bang, at this point, you know, again, smaller than an atom, that would, by logic and, and any kind of reasoning, have to be the center of the universe, regardless of whether we can ever find it or not. Well, and here's another question, George. If... If everything was compressed that we see now, plus what we don't see that's way out there, um, was all compressed into something smaller than an atom, then what could be contained in each atom that we see now? Wait, say that again? Yeah. If everything that we see now was compressed into something smaller than an atom, then what kinds of universes could pop out of the, the different atoms that we have around us now? Oh, yeah, Chandler, it even gets more strange. I mean, like, again, if, if we're using logic as the basis of our exploration, 
we have like this this one universe that like you know as far as we know the universe expands to a certain point because we can't see beyond that but we have to like you know that's it's known the as the observed universe but you know logic tells us that the universe has to be much more vast and then like take that principle and you're right as you're saying let's say we we there are trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of atoms you know in just even on earth and like if you if you go if you explore within any one of them within every of every of them you you can basically kind of like microscopically get smaller and smaller and smaller this is all theoretical we you know we have a, a certain limit to our technology but in a sense you you could keep getting smaller and smaller and never stop getting smaller and in, and so this basically what we would end up with would be an infinite number of infinitely minute universes all subsumed under this one infinitely expansive universe yeah and what's interesting is and even though i don't really understand the big bang thing and i don't understand how people know that I just think, well, even if everything that we have now was is somehow compressed into a small dot, that small dot, that small um, singularity or whatever they call it, would just be a part of a big universe still, because that would be what that Big Bang expanded expanded into. Right. Again, to me, that that transcends logic. You know, the, the physicists say that it didn't expand into every anything because you know the universe itself expanded. I, you know, again, that to me that transcends logic. It would seem to have expand needed to have expanded into something, but you know, I kind of like I kind of like accept their reasoning because I can't I can't think of any you know, you know, other than that it just transcends logic. Yeah, and doesn't it frustrate you that you can't explore everything in the universe? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, like, basically, the, the I'm kind of, like, honed in on, on the happiness. In other words, like, if I knew, like, how to be completely blissfully happy every moment of every day, and I didn't know another thing about anything else, <laughs> that'd be fine with me. Whereas, like, if I if I knew everything about the universe, but I didn't know anything about happiness, oh no, that that wouldn't be good at all. <laughs> yeah, and you know what's interesting about it, George, is I, I kind of feel the same way in a sense because people get into all these debates. You know, they they get into debating the um, the God thing, and then you've got the creationist uh, evolutionist debate. You know, which I think they're both going about things in a completely wrong way, actually. But I look at it and they're getting on onto all these things about, well, how, you know, what caused the Big Bang or, you know, what, who or what created the universe and, you know, and all, all this stuff. And is there an afterlife? And all. But instead, what they're doing is they're getting sidetracked onto all these things that distract them from finding their happiness now. Well, I mean that that's true. That's true. That's so much of, you know, there's this this saying ignorance is bliss. You know, sometimes the more we know, the more confused we become, the more we want to know, and the more we want to know, the less satisfied we are. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and so what's interesting is I mean, I'm very happy that we're discussing these very interesting topics because it's fun. It's making us happy just to talk about it. But if people take it so far into a realm where they get upset about it and they're not happy discussing it, then why bother? Absolutely. When, when, it, when it becomes divisive, when it becomes, you know, when people take things personally as they tend to because of this free will belief and, you know, just basically, you know, enter when they have preconceived notions that they're trying to defend rather than exploring what the nature of, of reality of truth is, then that makes things more difficult. Okay, Chandler, I think we're running out of time on this, but I think we covered it enough. Yeah, I think we did. I mean, yeah, we, we talked about, you know, why we don't have a free will and why it doesn't make any sense for things to be random and, you know, all, all this stuff about the universe. So, yeah, I guess we'll end this one. Um, you've been listening to Free Will, Science and Religion with Chandler Klebs and George Ortega. And we've had a lot of fun about consciousness, randomness, causality, the universe, and, and all the things that just blow your mind. So hope that you listen to 
our future episodes so your mind can be blown even more and expand like the universe. <laughs> Bye.